Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Chad Green is here with the City Rescue Mission. I'll put in a plug as you're uh, planning your holiday giving this year. The City Rescue <laughs> yeah. Mission can always use you your help. Less than 16 hours. <laughs> yeah. Chad will lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, right. I'll ask Councilman Ryan if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But right. I can see now everybody's standing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Father, we just come to, before you this year and, and just uh, come with you great hearts. Thank you for this year. Thank you for uh, education that's progressing, Father. Thank you for new roads. Um, and thank you for a community that's willing to put forth the effort to make those things happen, Father. Um, we're grateful for you and what you're doing in the city and give you all the honor and glory for that. And Father, as we look forward into a new year, we just uh, ask that you would just continue to compel upon our hearts to um, live in healthy community, Father. Think, think about those that are... Um, less fortunate, um, and uh, lift up our standards, Father, as we continue to move forward, Father. Help us to think bigger and bolder thoughts, Father. We love you, and I just pray for all the people in this room, city councilmen, Father, that you would bless their lives, Father, that you would um, bless their families, and, uh, and for all the efforts that they are putting forward as they come here and, and serve. Father, we love you, and uh, thank you for a new year. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll call the meeting to order. We're on item three of the council agenda. I'll look for a motion to move items three A, B, and C into executive session today. We yes. should have the information we need. We need to vote on the executive session separately for each one. So okay. We need to vote on the going to executive session separately. So, Pat, I'll take that as a motion first on item three A. And we have a second. Cast your votes. And it moves unanimously. Yes. Cast your votes. It moves unanimously. Is there a second? Cast your votes and it moves unanimously. On to item four, it's the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for December 17th. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for December 3rd. All right, do we have any comments or questions about the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We're on to item five, and this is requests for uncontested continuances. Mr. Mayor, I have two this morning, uh, both on page 14. Items uh, 8, 4, A, um, 8, A4 and 8, A5. 8, A4 is PUD 15, 14. The applicant is requesting that this item be deferred until January 21st. And 8, A5 is SPUD 729. And the applicant is requesting that this item be deferred until March 4th. Mayor, we do have people signed up for 8, A4. Okay. We have a couple of people that have signed up to speak on item 8A4, and as you heard the city manager say, the item has been deferred until January 21st. Um, rather than come back, would any of the three of you like to speak today, or would you rather return on that date? Yeah, it, it, it appears they may have left already. So we'll, we'll set those aside. We'll recess the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are three items. Comments or questions on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA convened as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Four items. All right, comments or questions on the PPA? Uh, I'm just on PPA, number A, uh, the change order, I think would need to be clarified a little bit. Uh, I talked to the city manager about this yesterday, but I th think it's important that these, these documents are as clear as can be because they become the official record of what we've done up here. And I think that first paragraph needs just a little bit of a clarification. I agree. Okay. Any other comments or questions about the PPA? We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. Two items. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with a consent docket. All right. We have a motion and a second. Are there any individual considerations? 
You all are too easy today. All right, cast your votes. Consent docket passes unanimously. On to the concurrence docket. Any individual comments here from the council? All right. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any individual comments to be made on the concurrence docket? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 7T. Okay. And I just want to uh, thank staff and also Oklahoma City Public Schools for addressing uh, the issues that we were having uh, at Edwards uh, Elementary School as it relates to uh, flooding. Uh, at that school because every time uh, it rains, it normally floods uh, in that school. So uh, thank you to city staff and also Oklahoma City Public Schools uh, for addressing that issue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nice comments, John. Thank you. Ready to vote on the concurrence? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We're on to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. The first is a series of zoning cases. 8A1 is in Ward 8 at 1441 West Memorial Road. It's an ABC issue. Pat, you okay with this? Hey, Your Honor, has uh, anybody signed up to speak on this? No, sir. No. Uh, it's an entertainment center, an event center, in, in an area of uh, restaurants. The ABC application certainly would not be unique to this area. Uh, I move approval. Second. All right, comments or questions here on item 8A1? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 8A2 is an ABC issue in Ward 2. The address is 7801 North May Avenue. Has anyone signed up to speak today? Yeah. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A3 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 6300 Northwest 164th Street. It's currently a plan unit development and would be a new PUD if approved. Pat? I'm sorry, I'm... We're on item 8A3. This one, I've had some questions on the uh, staff report I'd like to talk to the staff about. The applicant's represented by Brian Kuhn. And in the staff report, I'm confused as to whether a, a final plat will be required or not. Uh, it says in one place the final plat will be referred to, in another place it says it's not required. Will a final plat be required here? There is a final plat required. Uh, and, and one of the things the Planning Commission staff uh, suggested was a tie to the subdivision south of there. Or did you give another route? And say, has that been discussed at all with the applicant? It has been discussed. We do have a tie going to the east, to the south. There's no place to tie. The flat to the south is solid lots along that boundary. So we're, we, but we are tying to the east. By the east. So there will be a, another route into there. Yes. Okay. Uh, hearing that, uh, I would move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8A3. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Item 8A4 has been deferred until January 21st. Item 8A5 has been deferred until March 4th. Item 8A6 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 500 Southeast 15th Street. It's currently R2 medium low density residential, I2 moderate industrial, R4 general residential, uh, MH man manufactured home overlay, and a scenic river overlay district. And they're putting it all together into a new spud. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do we have any protesters? Uh, and is the applicant present? Can you uh, briefly uh, describe for this uh, uh, spur, please? My name is Brian Guz. I'm an architect with Fitzgerald Architects here in Oklahoma City. I'm representing Phil Fitzgerald, who is the, the project manager for this project. The project is uh, to expand Skyline Ministries' uh, existing facility to offer further further their services in the neighborhood. It involves uh, an addition to their existing building on the corner of 15th and Byers. And in order, and they've acquired a property across Byers to provide the additional parking that will will ease the traffic in that neighborhood. Thank you. The ministry uh, provides great service to the southeast. Uh, community so um, thank you to the applicant for everything that you all will do in the southeast uh, part of Oklahoma City I move for approval second. okay we have a motion and a second we're voting on item 8a6 cast your votes it passed unanimously item 8b is to close a portion of Broadway place that's in Ward 6 Meg Ms. Francis has anybody signed up to speak on this 
No, well, this is a um, case that we've been working on for a number of years. I know the applicant, or a number of months. I know the applicant is here. It felt like years, actually, guys. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a, just a great example of how things and the process works really well when everybody gets together. Uh, purpose of this closing um, had a couple of things. We were hoping to help secure the future of the dealership in its current location and allow them to not only expand the Jaguar dealership, but to uh, potentially add some new franchises and to help improve the security for their employees and their customers. The original plan was a little bit more elaborate than this, and working with the neighbors, we've, um, uh, I think, come to a great compromise, and I would move approval. Second. All right, any comments or questions then on item 8C? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. <laughs> item 8D is an ordinance that's here for final hearing. This is the third time it's been before the council. It has to do with some IRS regulations. I've skipped C. Okay, well, let's go back and do these in order. <laughs> Item 8C is a uh, name change proposal for Ward 7. Um, John, sorry to leave you out. Oh, that's okay, Mr. Mayor. Do we have any protesters? No one signed up. This item was recommended for denial by the Planning Commission. All right, anybody? I see uh, County Commissioner uh, Brian Mine is here. Are you here to speak uh, for this issue? Hi, John. Brian, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on Beverly Drive, being renamed Scooter's Way. Uh, Scooter was actually killed about an hour after Safari was killed on the same day uh, in a plane crash because his plane had malfunctioned. And um, the families were friends. And in addition to that, uh, Dr. Dell Phillips Jr. was his real name, was an innovative uh, scientist and doctor who had made uh, groundbreaking technology and patents in uh, stroke therapy and was a real uh, proud Oklahoman whom I think uh, might very well be considered for our Oklahoma Hall of Fame uh, for the kind of groundbreaking work he did. And uh, the property owners have all signed the petition necessary that uh, would be considered. And as our understanding, there is no objection to uh, this consideration. So I appreciate your vote in favor of it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, the, the, the Planning Commission voted against it because it's in violation of our policy about naming policy. Um, as much as I'd like to be in favor of, of uh, doing something to honor this person, uh, I think to change our naming policy is a mistake myself. We've had problems with that before where we've, uh, where we've changed names and this, this is named after a very prominent Oklahoman also already. And uh, I, I think we ought to look for someplace else to do this because I, I am, uh, we have a policy in place and it's in place for good reason. And the Planning Commission upheld that policy in their, in their comments. I just want to get that out before we go forward. I mean, the fact that there aren't any protests don't, don't really have anything to do with why the policy was established. You can find a lot of little one block or two block streets where people might agree to it, but it may or may not be in the best interest of the city to, to modify the policy in that way. This, this individual certainly is worthy of having a street named after him if we can find the right street, but to rename a street named after a prominent Oklahoman To me, is a, I th I'm, I'm in favor of continuing with the Planning Commission policy. How many blocks long is the is the street in question? Uh, a staff. I want to say it's. Go go ahead. It's just under three blocks long. Okay. Yeah. Um, the majority of the property along the street is actually owned by uh, the family. Um, I'm actually in favor of supporting this. Uh, if the council decides otherwise, then the council has that right, but I'm actually uh, in, in favor uh, of this. Okay. So um, I actually move for approval. All right. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion to say any comments or questions before we vote? Yeah, I, I think it's a very worthwhile individual, and I'm sure there needs to be some recognition, but I think. Chopping up our streets with little individual pieces of names is, is a bad president for us to set. 
Uh, it impacts uh, mail delivery, fire, and police protection as well. And I think uh, we need to adhere to the policy that we adopted some time ago on street name change. So I would vote against it. Okay. Anybody else ready to vote? All right. Cast your votes. And the motion fails. 7-2. Now on to item 8D, and this is the third time this item has been before the council. It has to do with IRS regulations. Move the item. All right. Any comments or questions here on item 8D? All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. All right. And Francis tells me the emergency is Move the emergency. here. Sec we have a second on the emergency. All right. Cast your votes, and the emergency passes unanimously. Item 8E would modify our outdoor events policy. And again, this is an up for final hearing, third time it's been before the council. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on item 8E today? All right, do we have a motion? Move the item. Second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And item 8F is another item up for the final hearing today. And we have uh, one person that has signed up to speak. No, there's more than one. All right, we have a small stack of people that have signed up to speak. Uh, item F and G both have to do with um, um, potential changes to our urban farming ordinance. Item 8F is specific to the chicken aspect of it, and item 8G is a little more uh, all-encompassing. Um, looks like the people that have signed up to speak are here on the first of the two, so why don't we call them before us. Christine Patton. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. Yeah, I will need your name and address for the record, please. Christine Patton, 2318 Northwest 49th Street. Although we have already heard many convincing reasons why our citizens support urban agriculture, we still need to examine the fundamental question underlying our discussion about urban hens, and that is this. When should we remove a freedom from the vast majority of our citizens in order to satisfy the personal preferences of some. In other words, when do we allow the opinions of some residents dictate what all of us can or cannot have in our own backyards? We the people voluntarily give up some freedoms for the greater good. We pay taxes and obey safety laws. But we should not be asked to part with our freedoms lightly. There should always be a clear and compelling cause backed by credible evidence and facts a dire need, a clear and present danger, or a public health or safety risk. Does a five pound quiet docile hen pose such a threat? Our wellness now friends, members of the largest health coalition in the state, assure us that urban agriculture and hens are in fact a benefit to public health. The leadership team of wellness now, which has nearly 200 partner organizations, voted to endorse these ordinances by a landslide vote of 16 to 1. Why? Because of the many health benefits to the public. Not everyone understands why hens are so significant to urban gardeners. My husband, for example. Hun, he asked me a few weeks ago, remind me why chickens are so important? First of all, I told him, gardening in Oklahoma is tough, and gardeners need all the help we can get. If hail, drought, or 110 degree heat don't destroy our tomato plants, then the hornworms will. And hens are perfect garden helpers. They eat those garden pests and turn them into organic fertilizer and transform kitchen scraps into nutritious eggs. If a hen isn't God's gift to urban gardeners, I don't know what is. But most importantly, I told my husband, people in cities all around the country have the freedom to raise a few hens on small urban lots, and we should too. Oklahoma City residents are no less responsible, no less worthy of freedom than the millions of Americans who live in cities where hens are legal, no less worthy than our neighbors in Norman or the residents of Dallas or Tulsa or Stillwater. The ordinance limits the number of hens and forbids roosters in order to make adding chickens to our backyards nuisance free. To assist this goal, several of our nonprofit partners have already pledged to offer free workshops and provide public education on how to care for hens once these ordinances are approved. In conclusion, although it may seem that we are merely discussing the legalization of a five pound fluffy egg laying bird, 
there are greater principles at stake here. On one hand, hens are no big deal. They don't typically cause problems with neighbors because hens don't crow. On the other hand, hens are a big deal because they represent a freedom that was taken away. Let's restore that freedom today. Thank you for your time, your attention, and your consideration. Thanks for coming down, Christine. Jacob Peeler. Hello. Um, Good morning, hi. Jacob. We'll need your name and address for the record, please. Uh, I'm Jacob Peeler, uh, 609 Northwest uh, 30th. And part of what I was going to touch upon, she's already has covered, and I think it was very well done in pointing out that it is kind of a showing it our freedoms and the fact that not everyone is going to be affected by it, only those who are interested in it will actually be doing it. So a lot of the areas that may be concerned about it may not even have to deal with it anyhow. The one thing I didn't want to point out, and it was kind of touched upon, I think, last time that we had this discussion was it's a really important step in encouraging community gardens and growing, and as that occurs, it will help Oklahoma City really uh, grow and being more self-sustaining and independent as a city. And it'll really be a huge benefit to things like the food pantries in case of disasters such as some of the tornadoes that we, the state is very really well known for, especially our neighbors being affected by it who sometimes go to us, as well as being less reliant on importing everything we eat from somewhere around us, which usually ends up being as far away as California. So I really think that it's really important to more encourage the growth of such community gardens. And it's not just a matter of whether or not a few people are annoyed by the idea of having chickens, which may or may not be in their neighbor's yards based on their choice. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Henry Kirk. Okay. Anyone else here hoping to speak on this item? I know there's been a lot of work between council and staff and, and uh, interested citizens about coming up with some options. I don't know where the votes are on this individual item today, but should it fail, I know there are other options uh, that we're looking at as, as far as uh, um, how we might, um, on, on smaller, uh, more trial basis, look at, at, at uh, trying to work out uh, in individual neighborhoods how we could have chickens and see how it works. I know some of the council um, has expressed um, thoughts about it. Just to put it the same over all 620 square miles, it seems like a big step from where we are today. Uh, yeah, Pat? No, I just have a, a comment. I am not opposed to chickens, but I am opposed to having chicken neighbors who have chickens. Uh, I've got a, a, a lot of my constituents are concerned about the impact of chickens, and I think the uh, the chicken supporters, if you will, uh, need to spend some time educating the public, because as long as the public has the perception that the chickens can be a nuisance, I'm going to continue to vote against. Yeah. Yeah, they, they make very convincing cases uh, when they come before us. Yeah, David. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I <clears throat> concur in part with uh, Councilman Ryan's comments that. Uh, I think it's just a, uh, an education process that we need to go through because uh, in Ward 5, the vast majority of comments that I've received have been against this ordinance. But many of the reasons I don't think are, are uh, based upon uh, a true understanding of what we're asking to be able to do. Uh, and so I think some of the alternatives that you mentioned will be helpful and then perhaps this entire ordinance could come back at some later date if it does not uh, pass today. Okay. Thank well, you. Go ahead. Well, I, I think that if the, only, if the only issue on the table was providing food security for the poor, that would far outweigh any argument that I've heard over the last month uh, against this. We have when we talk about having the lowest unemployment rate, of, the, we're talking about the metro area. We're talking about Edmond and Moore and Norman. Oklahoma City has a significant poverty problem. We had at our convention center on Christmas Day 6,000 people coming through there. 
waiting two hours at a time for a meal and a toy for their children. What six chickens and the healthy production of about six eggs a day would mean to those families, uh, I think outweighs any, anything, I've, anything I've heard. And I don't, uh, I, I, I feel at times that we're not responsive. Uh, I think the Greyhound bus station and, and the, the lack of action on the bus shelters would be two examples of the lack of, of responsiveness. Some of the uh, solutions put forward to the city as alternative solutions that have high fees, I think also would, would have a, a, a level of sadisticness uh, if the poor were asked to pay those kind of fees uh, to have chickens. Um, I, I would, I, I think that it can't just be dropped. But the, the public, I think, is educated. We have chickens throughout all 620 square miles. We have large-scale polls uh, from the Neighborhood Alliance that show 68% approval. And I don't think that the public needs to be educated so much maybe as the council. But I, I would um, ask Kenny for some, for some other potential uh, options for those who are in favor. Number one, could, could those in favor of urban chickens challenge this in court? If they, if they, had, uh, if they had a lawyer willing to, to fight for them, could they challenge the 1.0 acre conditional use? Could they say that um, we, we're saying that in Oklahoma City you can have chickens if you have 1.0 acres or more, but if you have 0 0.9 or 0 0.8 or 0 0.7 acres, you can't have chickens? Could they challenge that in court and argue that it's arbitrary our planning director told us a couple weeks ago that it was, he felt it was arbitrary. <laughs> we have the, the support of, I understand, every planner in the planning department. We have the unanimous support of the planning commission. Um, I certainly feel, for the record, feel it's arbitrary and capricious. Could, could those in favor challenge us in court, uh, challenge the, the 1.0 acre conditional use, and if they did, would they have a chance? Well, I think Dan will tell you, I probably shouldn't speak for him, that yes, they could go to court. And if they have a witness, that would, planning witness that would testify that that's arbitrary, unreasonable, and capricious, that, that particular line, they could challenge it. And would they, would they have a chance in court? It would be a difficult case. Almost all zoning regulations based on areas and are essentially an uh, arbitrary uh, boundary. We have uh, 6,000 square feet minimum lot size at single family residential. I'm not sure that you can go into court, we could go into court and prove that you absolutely have to have 6,000 square feet for each residence. Uh, our regulations also on zoning for RA are the one acre lot size. That's where it came from was that there are large areas of Oklahoma City that are zoned R1 that have more than an acre. But in RA, if you have an acre, you're allowed to have uh, animals to a certain extent. And in AA, you have to have five acres. But the, one, the 6,000 square feet, the one acre, the five acre, I'm not sure that that specific number can be justified, but I think there's a distinction between the density that can be. And that, that's what I'm, I mean, I've asked for six weeks now for any empirical data that suggests that 1.0 acre number. And if they can't produce it, I'm just asking, can it, based, would they have a chance in court based on, I mean, with the judge, whichever judge they get? Yeah, on a zoning case, it's, it's tried solely to the judge, and it's, it's just going to depend on what decision the judge makes based on the evidence that's presented to him. So anytime you go to court on a zoning case, you always have a chance one way or the other. Could, could those proponents do an initiative petition? Is this something that would be amenable to an initiative petition? So you could have a vote of the people? It's a legislative change, so I guess you could have an initiative petition on that. Okay. My, my concerns are this. I mean, we, we, uh, if you think about what the Neighborhood Alliance survey showed, it showed 60-some percent of the people. The Neighborhood Alliance doesn't represent the people that have the chickens for the most part. <clears throat> the Neighborhood Alliance doesn't have but one or two neighborhoods in my whole world. So none of those people would have been set part of that survey. I, I, I would tell you, I, I, would, I would guess that they don't have any uh, more than one or two neighborhoods in the south part of Megsport or the south part of uh, Lurish. 
So that survey was taken among the very people that we are now saying are the people that don't want chickens. But yet it produced two-thirds of the people that responded to that survey said it's okay. So it, it seems to me that, that the, uh, the public is, is important. I, I've, gotten, I've got a whole file here. This, this whole file is for people that have emailed me about chickens. There's probably three people in this file that say they didn't want chickens, and all of them complained about roosters, which are not part of this thing. I mean, I'm, the education process um, needs to start with us. We need to do the right thing. If we're going to wait until, until a few people that, uh, pardon the pun, but squawk about this, uh, are they still going to be the ones that control it? A minority of people control it because they're going to squawk about it because they don't understand it. I mean, how, how does that make any sense? It seems to me it's time to do it. Um, you know, if we don't have the votes today, we don't have the votes today. I mean, that's the way it is. That's just, I've become an expert mathematician in 20 years or 30 years of sitting up here, and it's, the number is five. So if you can't get there, you're not going to win. But it's not going to die. It's a good idea. It's, it's a reasonable idea. It's being done all over the country. Uh, and it, it's just time that we move forward and do it and quit talking about it. Larry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but I think I've been on record since the beginning because the residents in Ward 3 who live on R1 lots that uh, are members of the neighborhood associations that I go to are overwhelmingly against this particular initiative. And I've studied the uh, survey that Neighborhood Alliance did, and uh, they put up on the, on the internet a response that said, are you f in favor or against? They also did an excellent job of capturing the zip codes of where the responses came. And in looking at those responses from Ward 3, for example, the neighborhood that I, rep I live in has over 600 homes. Uh, it was like 98 to 2% against chickens. Uh, and the number of respondents, however, from, from that area of town was not statistically significant to make this survey a, an unbiased, uh, professional, if you will, survey. It was merely having people who had an interest respond. So the survey itself, uh, I don't think, is, is a conclusive proof at all. What is conclusive proof, I believe, in my case in Ward 3, is my interaction with neighbors in R1 neighborhoods again at neighborhood meetings and uh, who have come and also called me, they are uh, overwhelmingly against this particular ordinance and so the public is not overwhelmingly in favor of it at this time and therefore in representing those people in Ward 3, I'm going to cast a no vote. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah, Meg? Mayor, um, I just, a couple of other comments, lots of uh, the way I feel has already been said on the record. But I thought Councilman Greiner did a great job last time we talked about this, about identifying the fact that Oklahoma City, in fact, does allow chickens. We're among cities that allow chickens. It's just conditional. And the condition currently is that you have to have an acre of land. Uh, we had a very eloquent speaker a few minutes ago who talked about the greater good and not parting with our freedoms. Um, I think those people that are opposed to this ordinance change would feel that their freedoms are being trampled on. They've moved into urban neighborhoods where they didn't think they were going to have chickens, and they could, in fact, have chickens next door to them um, if we pass this ordinance. So I think this greater good discussion is a little bit um, two-sided in any case. Um, I have said all along that I believe that the burden of uh, the change should be placed on the people that want chickens not those that have chosen not to have chickens. There are lots of different ways we can say that, but you know, I think that there may be, as Councilman Greenwell has said, I, I think there's some options here to provide some compromise. And um, I've spoken to Sarah and her group, many of whom are here today, and again, I thank you, Sarah. You really did an amazing job rallying people to email us. <laughs> um, we've heard a lot of voices, and I've heard a lot of rational voices, and I really appreciate it. And in deference to Two councilmen over here, I believe this council is very well educated. We've spent a lot of time talking about this. In fact, more time talking about chickens than we have a lot of other significant issues, I think, on our agendas. And um, I believe that we are well educated. 
I went back and looked at the work that our staff has done to determine how many of the big league cities, Sarah, or NBA communities require permits, and at least five of them do. So it's not an unusual concept. And I think if we were to look at it from that direction, it would, would require, and I don't know what the numbers are, but I think we need to look at, you know, some having your neighbors agree, and um, and a small fee, councilman. I don't think I, I would hope the word that you didn't use was sadistic in putting on a fee. Um, I heard a very unusual comment, um, but I think if you charged a small fee for people to uh, get a permit for chickens. Um, I don't think that's an unreasonable burden. And so I'm not in favor of the ordinance the way it currently exists. And um, I would like to explore the option of some kind of permitting process. Okay. Bell's over here. All right, do we have a motion? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 8F. Everybody ready to vote? Cast your votes. The item fails, 2-7. We're on to item 8G. This is an urban farming ordinance. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on this item, Francis? Okay. You know, I, I can make a comment. Uh, we have a problem in Oklahoma City with appearances. And I would urge, if this ordinance is adopted, people be conscious of the appearance impact of what they do in their front yard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we've uh, indicated we're not going to be uh, overly enforceful on this particular issue, and I think we need to encourage people to remember that appearances are important to their neighbors, their neighborhoods, and to the city as a whole. And I think we need to make that point clear if we adopt these changes. I think these changes aren't, aren't bad, but I think the, if we ought to encourage people when they go to the front of their house to be conscious of appearances, and yeah. uh, the appearances of a, of a vegetable garden uh, to a lot of people is not as enticing as a green lawn or, or, or shrubs or bushes. Mayor, um, mm -hmm. on 8G, there is an amendment that I brought forth, 8G1, uh, to this ordinance that would replace um, <coughs> a section with some revised language that would allow up to two above ground rainwater storage containers smaller than 85 gallons to be located in front yards. And and so, that, that was it was one, and this amendment would make it two. Is that right? Uh, it was none in the front yard. Oh, I see. And it now would be the smaller decorative containers could be in the front yard to collect additional rainwater. Okay. So I, I would move the amendment before we vote on the final ordinance. All right, noted. We'll vote on the amendment first. Any other comments or questions on item eight G? Okay. Yeah, we'll need a second on the amendment. Francis, appropriate to vote on the amendment first. All right, cast your votes on the amendment. This is 8G1. It passes 9-0. And um, item 8G2 uh, is the, uh, the rest of the ordinance. All right, comments or questions here? All right, cast your votes. And it passes unanimously. Item 8H begins a series of four items that come to us from the Traffic Commission. The first is in Ward 7 and has to do with parking on the northeast side of 2nd Street. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes on item 8H1. It passed unanimously. Item 8H2 is also a parking issue in Ward 7. I move for approval. We have a second? Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8H3 is also in Ward 7, uh, another parking issue. All right, I move for approval. Thank you. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And finally, 8H4 is a parking issue in Ward 7. All right, I move for approval. Second. Cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. Item 8I is an item that's being introduced to Council today. It has to do with some changes in the Animal Welfare Ordinance. I think Bob Tiener is here to help explain what this would do. Briefly, this ordinance will uh, allow us to take cats, impounded cats, kittens, and puppies and transfer them directly from the shelter to foster care. And the foster homes will, will hold the kittens and hold the animals for the three to five day normal holding time. And then if they're not claimed, we can transfer them directly from the fosters to the rescue groups. What this does, it gives us uh, 
kittens and puppies are really susceptible to disease in our shelter, and so this gets them out of that environment for a longer time. And we, once we are able to transfer them out, we don't have to bring them back in. And what we'll do is uh, we'll continue to take pictures. We'll have their pictures on the website, on social media, and then at the shelter. So if someone does want to reclaim one of those animals, then the foster would bring it back to us, and we'd let them reclaim it. But as the memo shows, the recl reclaim rate for these groups of animals is really less than 2%. And so this ordinance gives us the ability to save more of these animals. And so that's what we're what we'll do here. Can we just ban them on lots of less than one acre? <laughs> yes. I mean, when you think about it, we're, we're doing all this trouble to do something about abandoned dogs and cats, and dogs are the most noxious animals that we have running around Oklahoma. And I have two dogs, but they're the most noxious animals we have running around Oklahoma City. And we're going to all this trouble to figure out a way to save their life or transfer them into foster care. They provide, they don't provide eggs or anything else. Just a, just a, Bob, Bob, I thought it sounded like that's my opinion about where our priorities are. Thanks for that enlightenment. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. I thought it sounded like a great plan, but and I do appreciate the fact that you'll keep photos online. You know, the numbers weren't huge, two percent or whatever, but I think the raw numbers were maybe seventy-five for you know, if somebody loses their puppy, forgive me, Pete, or their kitten, um, they're pretty anxious to be able to try to find it at the shelter. So as long as we keep a good record, I think that's. I think it sounds like a great plan. Our community partners, the Humane Society, Bella Foundation, they all support this ordinance because, you know, they think it's a good thing for the animals. David? Bob, I'd like to thank you for uh, this proposal. I think it's a great idea. And uh, anything we can do to uh, help uh, protect these animals and find a uh, permanent home for them, uh, I think is uh, commendable. And again, thank you for your work. In this Thanks, area. Bob. Item just being introduced today will be setting a public hearing for January 7th, and then final adoption is scheduled for January 14th. Do we have a motion to move this forward? Second. Cast your votes on item 8I. It passed unanimously. Item 8J reflects some changes in, in IRS regulations. This has to do with item J and K. Mayor, <coughs> IRS regulations have changed now, and on, <coughs> excuse me, on the flexible benefits. Uh, portion of it, you used to have to use them all in, in, the, in the year that you, you set those funds aside, and, and now up to $500 of that can be rolled into next year's plan. So J and K are companion items. One that's on the firefighter's plan and the other is on our, our plan uh, to uh, adopt to conform to those new IRS regulations, which will give more flexibility to our employees. Move on, J. Here's a question, Your Honor. Do we have to do this, or are we doing it to, to accommodate our employees? Is it allowed, but is it mandatory as well? I don't think it's mandatory, but I, I don't see any reason why we would not want it. I don't either, but I want to make sure before I vote on it, whether it's mandatory by IRS regulations or something the city is choosing to do. Colin Fonda. Yes, the, uh, the IRS released these rules on October 31st. It's not mandatory. It's an option for uh, employers to adopt for their plans and for the benefit of the employees to allow that carry over into the next plan year. I have no problem with the fact that it is a benefit that we, we, the city council, is extending to our employees. I think that's an important distinction to make before, before we suggest that the IRS is requiring it. Okay. Is there a motion on item 8J? Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8K? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8L and 8M are con collective bargaining agreements with our uh, union's employees. The council may remember we um, um, agreed with fire in uh, October, and uh, this would uh, move forward on police and ask me. Second. Good question. Do we have an idea when this, has this been voted on by the membership yet, or is it? Yeah, both have been ratified by, by the FOP and, the, and, the, uh, and ask me. Good, thank you. Okay, we have a motion on item 8L. Is there a second? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8M, is there a motion there? Cast your votes. And it passes as well. well thanks, staff, for all their hard work on that issue. 
Item 8N is a resolution that would uh, reflect changes in uh, what we call management, actually, though it, it's a it's much range. It's much broader than that. It's, it's, it's a lot of technical folks, chemists, planners, uh, engineers, uh, accountants, auditors. Yeah, one. I have a question on this one. On the, the, uh, the <coughs> tuition assistance program, does the city require that the course the employees taking has some direct relationship with is city responsibilities either now or in the future? I didn't catch all that, Mr. Frank. Yes, it again. It, does the city have a requirement on the tuition assistance program that the courses that our employees are enrolled in have some tie to their particular position or a position they would like to have? Could they take basket weaving or flying lessons? The assistant, the employee assistance program, is 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 a program to to help them through through. Uh, a, Personal issues. That well, this is, I'm talking about the, the specifically the tuition assistance program. Okay, tuition. There we go. The, tu the tu tuition reimbursement program. All right. Monica. Good morning. The tuition reimbursement program does not require that employees take classes that are directly related to their jobs, but we do want them to be working toward a degree and make a, a grade of C, I believe, or better. Thank you very much. All right, ready to vote on item 8N. Do we have a motion? All right, cast your votes. Item 8N passed unanimously. And item 8O has to do with the uh, payroll and personnel department. It, it's for general non-representative empl employees. So those are general people that are in the, would be in the general ASME classifications, but are exempted from ASME because of the work they do is generally classified either in the payroll department or in the personnel department. So it's just a handful of employees that are in this paper. Okay. Yeah. Cast your votes on item 8 It passed unanimously. Item 8P, I understand we do not need executive session on this item? Do not. Okay. How about a motion then to move this forward? All right. Cast your votes. Item 8P passed unanimously. Item 8Q, I understand we do not need executive session? Do not. Okay. Is there a second? second? Cast your votes. Item 8Q passes unanimously. Item 8R, I understand we do need executive session. Yes, sir. Move the item to executive session. Second. Cast your votes. That item moves to executive session. Item 8S is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here willing to speak under any item listed under 8S? All right, how about a motion then? Move the items. Second. Cast your votes. Item 8S. Passage unanimously. Item 9 is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on item 9? All right, how about a motion? Move the items. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 10 is items from council. Uh, Ed, I think you introduced the uh, item here that's item 10A. I did, and, and this is a, a topic that I've, I've discussed most of the issues before. I, I guess the first question would be, is there anybody who hasn't read this study? Just for reference. Everybody's read the CSNL study. So just, Megan, everybody else has read it. It was discussed with the council members prior to the maps. Have you, have you read the, the study? No, I didn't, have not read the study. John, have you read it? Uh, not yet. OK. So everybody else is ready. I have a question. Uh, did the city pay for any of this study? No, sir. All right, so, and the Chamber of Commerce is a private organization. Yes, sir. They conducted that study in, on their behalf because they were supportive of a mass item would ask the citizens to approve building a new convention. I, I think it was broader than that. I think it was put together for a lot of reasons. I think one was to identify what our market conditions were. But and, and it, it had a lot of purpose. As I recall what the president of the chamber said a couple of weeks ago, his reluctance to, a, a, to a put this into the public domain was based on the fact that it contained some information that identified the weaknesses and the strengths of the city in their ability to attract conventions. And that would give our, or could give our uh, competing cities a leg up on us. And that was his reluctance. To, uh, Put this into the public domain. Once it was given, once it, it is, if it is given to us, it becomes an item in the public domain, and we can't put the record, can't keep people from asking for it. 
So I, I might just address that, Pat, because I, I think that goes to the issue. There, these studies are really done, um, they cover the same ground in every city that they do, convention, sports, and leisure. And I've read a number of them, and Pete and I went over to the chamber and read it from beginning to end, and it looks exactly like all the other cities that, that I've seen. Convention, sports, and leisure has done a number of these studies in city after city over the last few years, and they're all public. They're all online. But this in North Dakota in 2012, Boise, Idaho in 2010, Boston, Massachusetts in 2009, Detroit in 2010, Lexington, Kentucky in 2011, Miami Beach in 2008, New Orleans in 2009, Provo, Utah in 2009, San Antonio in both 2008 and 2010, Louisville, Kentucky in 2013, Los Angeles in 2011. All the convention I think sports it's those cities did that. They made the choice. The, the people who sponsored it made that choice. It's up to them whether they want it released or not. And the people who did ours don't want it released. And so I think, we, as a as a city council, we do not have the authority to, to request that they ask that well, they release it because it's a private matter. It's like uh, your uh, your records as a, as a doctor. Those are private matters. They are not available to the public. And they shouldn't be. And as I think that the people who sponsored this particular study and paid for it, that they don't want it made available to the public, that's their decision, and I think it's up to them. We, Pat, I agree. We don't have the authority to compel them to release it, but we have the authority to request that they release it. And I just, and I think that we should, we should vote today on, on whether we think it's, it's necessary. And I'll just tell you why I think it's very, I think it's important as we move forward on this largest of all projects in the history of MAPS, and that's that to date we only have the executive summary. But the number of attendees that are being modeled that you'd have to have to understand the stone study that we heard is not released to us or the public. The structural obstacles are not, it's not a secret. We don't have enough direct one-way flights here. We have harsh weather. We have public transit deficiencies. We have sidewalk and city infrastructure deficiencies. There's nothing in there that's proprietary or especially that other cities wouldn't understand but about. But that's, the that's not the position of the people who did it and paid for it. Their position is it might. So I think we ought to honor their feelings about this because the city has didn't pay for the study, didn't participate in the study. So I don't think we have, any op we have even the, the uh, authority, the right maybe, to go ask these people to release it. If they say no and they have said no, that's as far as it ought to go. I'd, I'd like to just make my, my argument and then you can vote against it. You can't, for the public. I heard, I've heard your argument several times, Councilman Shadid. I don't need to hear it's it again. It's not for you, Pat. It's for the public. Well, the public needs to understand. The public heard it as much as they want to probably because they watch, the public watches television. We've got some excellent reporters who report these things in the newspaper. I think the public is well aware of your objections. You've come out against MAPS over and over again, and that's, that's very clear in the comments you've made, despite the fact that you say that you're in favor of MAPS, everything else you say shows that you don't like MAPS. I, I, I take issue with every single word of that. Uh, I take, take, issue, take issue with anything I say, Councilman. I'd like to make another comment, if I could, about this. We are today celebrating New Year's Eve of 2013, moving into 2014. This study was done in 2009 with data earlier than that. I think it's irrelevant today, Councilman. And my opinion would be if we feel like we need additional information, we need another study, let's get one. But I don't think there's any sense in relying on 2009 and earlier data when um, conditions have changed so dramatically. There, there are things that are still relevant, like in the study it talks about changes that would need to be made to the CVB and its budget things that talk about the ongoing monitoring that needed to be done in these last four or five years that I'm not sure has been done, the recommendations that the study told us to do. The relationship between the hotel and the convention center and the, how that's suppressing convention center business is very much relevant today. And that's all included in the report, but not the executive summary. And as we move towards market conditions, market realities that are, that are different than even 2009, where we're moving towards the, con the construction of a $200 million hotel, which m may very well co uh, require complete public ownership, $200 million in revenue bonds, with things like this council committing uh, the general fund as collateral to get a lower interest rate. Either, either massive public subsidies 
or complete ownership. That's a very radical departure from MAPS in which we collected the money and then spent it. Now we're talking about morphing MAPS into borrowing and paying interest on as much as $200 million. To not have as much information as possible for the public to make an informed decision about the hotel, which frankly was not, no number, no amount of subsidy was discussed during the MAPS campaign. Um, not having this study uh, available to them was part of the reason. But we told the public that we were going to triple the economic impact. That's what we said in our MAPS 3 commercials. We were going to triple the economic impact if the public voted for a $250 million convention center without telling them that it would require us to potentially borrow as much as $200 million for a hotel. We're not going to get the 285,000 square feet that, we, that this study recommends. We already know that we don't have enough money for that. It assumes completion of a $200 million hotel. We don't understand where, how we're going to triple the economic impact from $16.7 million to $45.6 million. It's not understood without seeing that study how we're going to triple the economic impact when no city in America has ever even doubled their economic impact, much less tripled it. Is it plausible that as we consider making this huge step on a hotel that we're going to triple our business when cities are giving away space for free and nobody's been able to triple their business? Uh, I don't think you can understand the Stone study or the OCU study without having this. And I know who can't understand it for sure, and that's the public. The public cannot understand what's being presented. Stone has no previous experience in convention center studies. PFM that we're talking about hiring has no experience in, in financing uh, subsidies. You, you have to have all this information, or at least the, I think the public does. So I would move for approval. All right, is there a second on item 10A? I'll second it for the purpose of the discussion. Um, I, I have a couple comments. I, I, at one level, Penn, I agree with you that it's a private study. But the fact is it changes its, its composition a little bit when we're now being asked to finance a hotel. I mean, it, 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 the study itself is private, but based on that study, the hotel needs to be built, we're being asked to finance it. I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that one way or another. I, my natural tendency is to say, wait a minute, you know, we, we, maybe we don't need to do that. But I think when, when that study is used as a basis to justify a building that we're now going to have to subsidize and maybe put the full faith and credit of the city of Oklahoma City behind, I think that changes it a little bit. I'm a little troubled by the fact that it is a private study. Uh, but, but when I look at the fact that all these other cities have done, quote, private, in quote, studies and release them to the public as part of the way to get the public to support the project, I, I think maybe that makes sense. Um, the other part, uh, what Meg said about the relevance of it, I tend to think that you're probably right, Meg. It is probably, I mean, it's five plus year old information. It, it probably does lose some of its relevance. But it's not losing its relevance with regard to the request the request that, that it generated, the request that was, uh, we're facing right now, was generated by the study. So we ought to know what it says exactly. The public ought to know what it says so we can determine whether or not it's irrelevant. I think it probably is not relevant. I would agree with that. But at this point, I think um, uh, that um, uh, it's not inappropriate to ask for it in light of the fact that we're going to be asked to spend this money or use the full faith and credit of the city. It's just not that big a deal. But Pete, we haven't asked I, I do it think, yet. wait just a minute, I'm not, don't interrupt me like you did him. Just let me talk and then I'll, I won't interrupt you. The, the other piece of it is that, um, that once, we, once we're asked that, then we, have to, then we have to decide what we're going to do. And I think we ought to have all the information out there to do it. it it's not, I don't know what information, that, how that's going to change things. But to go and, and put the full faith and credit of the city behind revenue bonds for a hotel and put the, and the, with the potential that the city would be put into the hotel business is a long stretch from where we were when we voted on maps in 2009 or not to nine. It's a long way from there. I'm not opposed to it. And I, I don't, I'm not going to get into this political fight about whether Ed's for maps or against maps and all that. That's just... That's stuff for, for February, March. But, but uh, I, I don't think if we're going to be asked to do that, that, we, that it is 
inappropriate for us to ask. If they say no, they say no, and we go on down the road. But I don't think it's inappropriate for us to ask. And I, I think we're getting caught in this principle thing. It's, it's, it depends on whose principles you're talking about. I mean, the principle from my standpoint is you're going to come to me as a councilman and ask me to spend that money, then you need to make full disclosure. The principle on their side is it's our information, and we don't have to make full disclosure. One of those two is right, and I'm not sure which it is. Right. I'll help you make that decision when you face it. But I think he, we, we've not been asked to do anything yet in terms of financing the hotel. Nobody's asked the city to buy the hotel. Nobody's asked the city to put the full faith and credit of our uh, pledge, our, our revenues, sales tax revenues to support that hotel. And I think we are premature to make a decision on what might happen. And that that's, has nothing to do with principles. That's sort of practical. You make a decision based on the facts you have in front of you on what the question really is. And we don't have that question here this morning. The question we're talking about this morning is, is the ability of an organization that does a study to keep it private if they choose to do that. And the other, other city councils may have done things differently. Other city uh, chambers of commerce may have done things differently. That's wonderful. But our position right now, my position anyway, is it was a private study, and if the people who did pay for the study don't want to make it public, that's up to them. All right, we have a motion and a second. Anyone else want to comment before we vote? All right, let's cast your votes. And the item fails three to six. Items from council. James? James? Okay. Ed? Larry? I, I've been given a job, Mayor, and I, I, I beg the indulgence of the council. Councilman Mars used to always recognize scouts when they came into the uh, council chambers. And uh, Pete uh, suddenly came up with a, a revisionist of history and declared me the oldest uh, city councilman and that I had the responsibility now to, uh, to recognize the scouts. Well, I think that in areas of total service, Mr. White is still the, uh, the longevity king. But if we could call the scouts up and have them introduce themselves, sure. uh, I'll fulfill my responsibility, at least to Councilman White. Yeah. If you all don't mind, would you all come forward? And, uh, Good. We can get a little more information on your, on your troop and your efforts here today. I think they were electing a spokesperson on their way up to the counter. <laughs> yeah, would you tell us your name and, and, and the troop and, uh, and who's behind you? Um, my name is Regan Waters. I'm troop 385. Okay. My name is Sam Salas, and I'm also from troop 385. My name's um, Jacob Warden, and I'm from troop. 385. I'm Tyler Dudley, and obviously we're all from Troop 385. All right. <laughs> I'm Zachary Sellers, and I'm Troop 385. All right. I'm Sam Sellers, Troop obviously 385, Scout <laughs> Committee member. Um, we have some young men here who, in order to achieve EGLE, they have to pass citizenship in the community. And this is one of the requirements is to attend this meeting, uh, talk about uh, topics that were discussed, and any disputes, they get to now go home, uh, create their own resolutions, and, and discuss those at a later time. Um, we're, we're grateful for being recognized. Uh, these young men, not to take too much of your time on this, on this holiday eve, um, but they decided that this is what they needed to, where they needed to be, even though it's a vacation for them from school. Um, Tyler started this. However, uh, the other young men agreed. So thank you very much for this time. Well, I'm anxious you. to know how you feel about chicken, so would you get back <laughs> to us about that? <laughs> yeah. and, and, I, and it is definitely good to see Boy Scouts uh, coming up here being involved. Uh, I actually chair the New Horizon okay. District of the last Frontier, <laughs> Frontier uh, Council, so it's definitely good uh, to see Boy Scouts. And I also serve uh, on the board for the last Frontier uh, Council uh, for Oklahoma. Uh, so it's definitely good to see an uh, organization that I am actively involved in uh, here. So again, uh, thank you uh, Boy Scouts for being here uh, this morning. Appreciate your interest. Thanks for coming down. Good luck on that road to being an Eagle. Uh, Larry, any other comments? All right, Pete? 
Just one, or a couple. The on balance, this has really been a good year for Oklahoma City. I think we, you know, we we have our differences about things, but this has really been a good year, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the citizens and the people that I serve with here for the for the quality of this year. I, I haven't felt well the last six or eight weeks, and it's sometimes when you're home and you don't feel good, it gives you an opportunity to to uh, think about all the good things and, and then and, and the things you're blessed with in addition to trying to get well. And one of the things I've thought about is the uh, is the quality of the people that sit around this horseshoe. And despite the fact that we have disagreements, uh, I have a great deal of respect for all of you, and I appreciate your time and your service. I know as somebody that's done it, my, that does it with you that it is uh, at some sacrifice that we do this, and I appreciate it. The staff, uh, I just I want to take this opportunity to say that. Uh, on another note, we, when we did the uh, approval of the contracts, I, 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 wanted, I started to say this then and, and probably should have. Uh, this has been a good year, I think, for the union relations. I, I, I see uh, Phil here today, and, and I know how um, how much time and energy was put into working the, the agreement out between the fire union, and I know the same thing happened on the police with AFSCME, and it was much less um, acrimonious, if you will. Um, it just went much better. I'm glad to see it done here during 2013 as opposed to going into next year like it happens sometimes. Um, it's just, it, I just, on balance, it's a good year, but I want to thank the unions for uh, for what I consider to be an exemplary year in, in uh, working out some thorny problems and making things move forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I would like to encourage all of the individuals who are planning to come down this evening to opening night, to uh, especially those who come in from the west part of Oklahoma City, to use the new Crosstown exit. It's a uh, great addition to the I-40, and it really uh, is, is very helpful as far as making your way downtown as well as when you're leaving downtown to utilize the new Crosstown exit. I am surprised by the lack of vehicles that currently are using that, but it's a great way to get on and off I-40 and eliminate a lot of the traffic problems that we normally encounter on the west Western Avenue uh, entrance and uh, exit. So hey, you mean to quit announcing it. It's nice. Yeah. It just I, really, really, I was, I was <laughs> I'm not, you're only caught on that thing. I was born <laughs> with that, but it's it's really a nice addition, and uh, I have to apologize for my frustration when we first opened the new I-40 and, and the uh, backlog that we were experiencing getting onto it from Western Avenue, and this is is helpful, and I, I think we're going to see continued improvement along those lines. And uh, I, again, I'd like to wish everyone a Happy New Year's uh, and a safe uh, Happy New Year's Eve. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Meg? Uh, same thing there. I just would like to take this opportunity to, to thank everybody for um, making this job as easy as it can. We have an amazing staff from the city manager on down. Um, thank you for all the hard work um, that's made 2013, I think, a very successful year for the city. Hope everybody's coming down to opening night tonight. It's going to be beautiful weather and should have a great crowd. Jane Jenkins is here from downtown Oklahoma City. And Jane, I know you don't host this event, but you're a big part of it. So thank you very much. And I just wish everybody a very safe and healthy New Year. Um, look forward to working with everybody in 2014. All right, John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to say uh, Happy New Year to the residents and uh, citizens of Ward 7. Uh, 2013 uh, has been a great year for the people of Ward 7 who I proudly uh, represent. Uh, there are some things that soon that we're going to be able to announce proudly. Uh, some things that they said that could not be done in Ward 7 and especially in Northeast Oklahoma City. We're going to get it done uh, come uh, 2014. I also would like to recognize our city staff that we have. We actually have some great city staff. And also, I do want to recognize uh, the, uh, the firefighters and ASME and FOP. We do have a good group of union officials, good group of, good group of uh, union uh, uh, members. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager, a job well done to, to your staff. 
uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor uh, to work with the city staff that we uh, do have. And also, um, it's good to have a, a good working relationship with uh, uh, the chamber. Uh, and, and, and I actually have to say I have a good working relationship with the chamber. Uh, there are some things that the chamber and I are working close uh, together, so it's good uh, to have that relationship to get stuff done uh, for the people of Ward 7, especially in Northeast uh, Oklahoma City. So uh, thank you, uh, Ward Williams, and also Peter uh, Delaney from uh, the chamber. And it has been a joy and pleasure to work with each member uh, of this council, despite us uh, sometimes disagreeing on issues. It's good to disagree uh, sometimes. Uh, so it's, it has been a true uh, blessing to serve with each and every one of you all. And I can truly say I love everybody on this council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Pat? Thank you, Your Honor. If, if Mr. Councilman White's uh, compliment was magnanimous enough to include me. I appreciate that, Mr. Clark. I do apologize for interrupting you. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question. I, I, first of all, I, I best I wish everybody a very happy New Year. Me up. I think we we have a tremendous potential in the city to continue the momentum we've got. It's a great place to live. It's a different place to live than it was 10 or 50 years ago. And I can remember working downtown in the 70s when if you stepped across Broadway. It, in the middle of the day, you were in no danger of being run over because nobody came downtown. So anyway, I, I, uh, I think we've done a good job, uh, and I, uh, I want to make a point, though. I think when there are disagreements on this council, it doesn't mean that it's divisive. It means that people have different opinions. And I think it's important that our citizens realize that when they elect councilmen, they elect people who, by virtue of the fact that they're here, have strongly held opinions about how the city should manage. And we may not always agree, but we are all committed, I think, to the welfare of the city. So I think it's a good point to make. The second thing I have is a question for the city manager. Do we have uh, temporary traffic signals we can put in location uh, prior to a permanent installation made? Yes. Oh, we, we have access to them. We may not have them, but we can get them in a short notice. The, um, uh, we've run into several problems in Ward 8 with our road construction, where it, the projects have taken such a long time that it, we've impacted the the uh, performance of some of the retail facilities adjacent to those projects. And I think it, it, it behooves the city to, to, try, to try to derive methods, processes that he make those projects move as quickly as we can. And it, I would suggest that maybe we make one of the, I don't know how, if, if the number of days is assigned by the city or the contractor asks for those days based on the work, but I do think we ought to maybe give some recognition to that when we award the bid, just because it's the best price doesn't the best deal. If it's much longer than somebody else's bids. Anyway, just an opinion, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Pat. All right. The city manager reports. Well, first of all, I think Councilman White wanted to add uh, some more. one more comment. Uh, we, Tim and I had the opportunity this uh, week to meet with um, uh, Mr. Buchanan, who is the new. Uh, a member of the Oklahoma Water Resources Board, and also the president of the Farm Bureau, and Rob Moselle, who is a Farm Bureau representative and an activist for, for agriculture and water uh, policy all over the state. A very, very good meeting, just an extremely good meeting. What we found was that I think each of us may have suspected before we went into the meeting, but what, what we found was we have a lot more things that we can agree on uh, then we disagree. And the water policy for the state of Oklahoma is going to be a major thing over the next few years. Um, it's obvious that we, uh, the way the Water Resources Board has been re, uh, the membership has been reallocated, we, we, have, we will have less impact as a city on the decisions. But that just means we're going to have to work harder to try to make friends and to make people understand that we're part of a system. Um, we, if, if, we're looking, if we ever look toward the idea that, that the ultimate um, a solution to water problems in, in the state of Oklahoma is, is the transfer of water from the, from the areas where water is more plentiful to areas where it's needed, Oklahoma City's got half the infrastructure necessary to do that right now already in place, and we're getting ready to expand that. And I think we need to emphasize that. We need to make sure they under, that the folks in western Oklahoma understand that 
we're not opposed to that. that we, we are extending at, on a consistent basis water to the west, treated water to the wet, west. Might be simpler to extend a raw water to the west if necessary, but I just felt like it's really good. I think Jim had the same feeling, and I got a note from Rod that he was pleased with it. Um, I just, it was a really good first step, uh, I think, to um, trying to, to reconcile the differences between us. Um, the Farm Bureau has not really been our friend much in, in, in certain things. They, they felt like we were on the opposite side from them. Uh, water Resources Board changed, but I think it just, I just, I, I would be missed not to mention it when, I, when it first came around because uh, I, I really felt, really felt good about it. The guy uh, that's the new uh, Water Resource Board member and the president of the Farm Bureau uh, drove up from Altus to meet us at a 9.30 meeting, which is a pretty good indication of his willingness to, to want to talk. Um, he has a background in some of the things that we are concerned about. Principally, he is a co-op manager for a water, rural water district that ha stores water in Lake Lugert and distributes it distributes it to its members. So he understands that when it doesn't rain, there's not water in the lake, and you can't, you don't have the water to distribute. And if you try to distribute what's there, you're going to make the fishermen mad. He's, we have this kinship that, that I think is something we can play on because he understands the problems we had in taking water from Canton this year probably better than anybody that could possibly be the president of the Farm Bureau. I mean, it, it just couldn't be better than that. It's just a, it's really a good start, I think. It's a good way to kick off 2014. We spent a lot of time together. It was a good meeting. I should have said that earlier. Pete, can I ask you a question? Is there any, uh, is it feasible to uh, at least look at some kind of system of transferring water from eastern Oklahoma out to western Oklahoma? I know it goes beyond the city's mm -hmm. uh, responsibilities, but... Well, here's what, this is the point we made in the meeting, Jim and I both talked about. We've got the, 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 the Toka pipeline uh, that, that's a 60-inch line that comes from Matoka, brings raw water up here. That's halfway when it gets to Oklahoma City. That's halfway. We're getting ready to put a 72-inch line, which will more than double our capacity to bring raw, raw water up here. And the easement is potentially wide enough for a third line. It's, it would be a tight fit, but it's potentially wide enough for a third line. So with that kind of ability to transfer water, it's not impossible. And one of the things we talked about was that everybody talks about it. When you look at the city, I mean, I mean you look at the state, only one entity has done anything about it, and it's us. And we, that's something we all need to be proud of. When you talk about, when you see that statue out in front of, of Stanley Draper, and you think about the vision that he had in, in the 60s to do all this, we stand on the shoulders of people that thought those kind of thoughts. And, and I think anything's possible. We've got so much infrastructure in, in the ground now. The easements are there. You think about what the cost would be if you started from scratch in 2014, but we don't have to start from scratch in 2014. We've got water down there. We've got the, we would own one of the lakes. It's our lake. Um, we've got pipelines connecting two of them. We're negotiating. We're going to talk some more about that in executive session. And I think we're going to feel good about, in the, about what we hear in the executive session. Um, I think that's what we ought to dream. That that's what we're going to do. I, th I think Stanley and the Chamber's vision and the city that, that the city bought into in the 60s, um, you know, I, I've told this story before, but the next election, four council members that were up for office got beat over, over building the Atoka pipeline. So it wasn't without risk, and it wasn't without some vision that that was done. But look at what we've done with it now. I just think we need to keep that in mind at going forward. We need to think outside that box, because um, I hope I answered I probably answered it six times. Thank you. That's, that's, <laughs> if the answer is yes, right. Clear, right. <laughs> City Manager reports. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple of things. The sales and uh, tax collection report for December is a little bit mixed. The, uh, uh, we're over last year's uh, collections by about 2.2, and last year was a really, really good month. So we're about a percent on our target. We're still a couple million dollars plus 
under target for the year. The use tax, for some reason, was just incredibly high this month. We, we, it was a million dollars over what we thought we'd be. The use tax has been down a little bit, but the use tax is very volatile. Uh, as Mayor and I were talking about yesterday, I think it's going to be really interesting to see this next check because of, of the Christmas, because of one, the influx of, of people using the, 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 the Internet. Two is that we were short a weekend between Thanksgiving and Christmas because Christmas ran late this year. And secondly, we had a couple of weather events on a couple of weekends during during that time frame. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly how that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to be optimistic, uh, you know, based on what we're hearing. But we'll see. And and the economists that we employ have have, have said that they they expect our revenue to pick up in the second half of the fiscal year. That's and correct. So we'll cross our fingers that they're right. You know, as the council was talking about what a, what a good year 13 was and some of the accomplishments, I, I started jotting down things that have happened, not in the Hall of 13, just in the last two months. And I just want to highlight a few things that, 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 that have happened, all that have gone through this horseshoe in the, just the last two months. And so we'll start with downtown. We had a GE announcement for the GE uh, Center. Center in Ward 7. Uh, the uh, C21 Hotel uh, uh, w w w was uh, come through council. Uh, the Journal Record Building, which we've been struggling with for over a decade, uh, is uh, well over a decade, actually. And you're the only one here. That, that <laughs> no, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, we, we came up with a solution on that. We have a new office tower that was announced for downtown. We have a new uh, elementary school that's making great progress. It'll be open in the fall. Uh, new housing addition that we uh, helped a little bit up on along uh, uh, 13th and Chartel, I guess it is. It'll be a big addition that went through, the, through the, 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 the process. And the new police headquarters will begin construction uh, next month, or next month being January. So that's a lot of downtown activity. And I know we always get criticized that all we're focused on is downtown. Not true, because things that happen outside of downtown, and again, just this month, Southwestern, I know a project very important to, to Mr. Greenwell was completed in, in, in this month. 164th and Penn, which I know is a, a, a intersection near, uh, near and dear to Mr. Uh, uh, Ryan. The last section of concrete was poured last Friday. We awarded the contract for the uh, Western Streetscape uh, over, over the last uh, a few weeks, and that's the beginning. Uh, we allocated more money to sidewalks. We have more sidewalk projects under construction. We now have trails under construction. And then administratively, I think there's, there, there are some things that, that happened, uh, some of them today. One was the uh, special events ordinance that we, we adopted that we've been, we've been working on for, for uh, gosh, a year or not, or not more. Urban agriculture, which we passed today, didn't include the chickens, but my, my guess is there's going to be further discussion about that, and there'll be, there'll be some further discussion and in, 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 in something coming down the line. So you don't always get it right the first time, but it'll come on, on down the line. And the vacant and abandoned buildings ordinance so that we adopted just, just a few weeks ago. Significant, I, I think. Uh, ordinances that will help us uh, grow the inner core the, 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 and deal with some of the, the problems of blight in, in Oklahoma City. I mean, that's just in two months. That's, that's really a lot. And so there are a lot of positive things going on down in Oklahoma City, and I think we're, we're, we're very blessed, and I look forward to working with you now all next year. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Citizens to be heard. Joe Sarge Nelson. Well, y'all already know who I am, Joe Sarge Nelson, Oklahoma City, and I understand a few of you are not too happy with me. That's all right. You won't be happy today either. I'm going to show you this picture, and this is as close as you're going to get. Some of you might recognize it. City employee, I will tell you straight up front, I do not like being threatened my life at all face to face. This man said this threat came straight from City Hall. It is on record. I don't know who made it. I really don't care. But it does change my tactics a lot. I came here with oh, two or three pages worth of stuff. Mainly to talk to this man here and you too. And your trips to New York, odds and ends, where it's costing you, how, uh, how you afford to make all this stuff. Stories that come to my office by people. I've got the names. I don't do anything I can't back up. And I want to ask you point blank, and it's probably none of my business, but as a citizen it is. Uh, some years back you made a request and told the people that you were going to go to work for Ackerman McQueen to supplement your income. Do you recall that remark? Sarge, you're not here to ask questions. You can comment to council if you'd like. Okay. Well, I'm here to find out the facts, and as a citizen I have a right to those facts. 
just like Mr. Counts there. He came from the Water Department 11 plus years ago. Also, he was appointed head of MAPS. Now he winds up with that city job. I'm going to check in and find out whose credentials are doing what, because I don't, uh, I don't like being buffaloed by nobody. And I doggone sure don't like being a target from anybody. That's four now. One from the county and three from this city. And I'm real tired of that. And I've been hearing remarks that just like back in 206 when you was riding around a little convertible, all this religious stuff and all this sort of stuff. thing that went on over here at the Civic Center. That is pornography in its highest detail. This is a Christian community, and that's got to stop. And it will stop. Now, I don't know if there's any bisexual people up here or any gay, but if they are, be proud of it and make it known and let everybody make their own decision on what they want to do about it. Now, I don't know if anybody up here that is or isn't, but I told Joe a long time ago, I ain't going to play games with the city anymore, whether I'm allowed to talk or I'm not allowed to talk, but I am a citizen of this people. I suggest for the record, get 200 police officers on the street. We need them, and we need them bad. I'm getting tired of people calling in and me talking to people every day, and the same question seems to come up. 200 to 626 square miles, we got 933 officers, and half of them are on the street. That ain't even close to being what we need. Y'all can afford it. He makes a quarter of a million dollars and makes more than the governor and the vice president of the United States. And we got officers and we need all the help we can get. And I don't know where you got your education. I'm assuming some of the money might have came from Chesapeake, as I'm told. Possibly even from Aubrey himself, and I know him very well. He got a pretty shaky deal himself. But the bottom line is, we're going to have to do something. And I'm getting real frustrated. And that remark in this man's picture was about all I needed. And I will, I will act on it. Gentlemen, you all have a nice day. We have executive session. We'll be back.
The council has returned from executive session. We discussed item 8R, and we've also uh, discussed items 3, A, B, and C. Reflective of the um, labor negotiations that we've had with our unionized employees, uh, the council has uh, decided to e extend a 2% raise to the three employees that, that uh, serve the council, and that would include the city manager, the municipal counselor, and the city auditor. Um, the manager's salary would uh, increase hourly to 112.07. The um, counselor's office would uh, receive a, a raise to 83.87 an hour, and the auditor's uh, salary would increase in increased to 69.18 per hour. Again, this is about a 2% raise. I'll need a motion and a second to make it official. And it's effective January 1st. Thank you for pointing that out. It's effective January 1st, which is tomorrow. Okay. Cash votes. And it uh, passes unanimously. We don't. We, we generally don't do the judges at the same time, but I may want to bring. I want, I want to bring back a review as to what the judges' salaries are, so we can make sure we're not leaving them out of the loop. And I may want to try to do that over the next month, sometime, to make sure because they are they are the only other employees we have besides the manager, the auditor, and the attorney. All right, ready to adjourn? All right, we're adjourned.